right. Well, on Zoom with us this morning is Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley, who is here to talk to us about the government's management of COVID. Yesterday, we had the most amount of deaths that we've experienced so far since the beginning of the pandemic. But honestly, I thought we enjoyed quite a bumper 2020 in the handling. Have we started unraveling? Prime Minister, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Natalie. Good morning to your team. I understand one of them is Rockus. <laughs> <laughs> you got the right one. It's Rockus and Curry. Curry is the nice gentleman who I think you should get into the politics because he, he <laughs> always says everything correctly. And then you have Rockus, who is more like me. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll take your advice as soon as you join the group, right? <laughs> me? <laughs> no, man, I kind of cool right here, you know, Doc. I kind of cool right here. Doc, welcome to the No Morning Show. So you you recently got your negative uh, PCR test of, from COVID-19. How are you feeling, though? And what was it like, you know, those weeks in isolation? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been tested three times um, during my outing in Tobago. And um, it's it's a very sobering thing in that, you know, to be infected by a, a, a virus that is killing people, in some instances doing it with such efficiency that you hardly get a chance to respond to it and that there's no real cure in treatment. Um, it's something that an everyday experience and is not to be taken lightly and that's why I, I have an, an idea of what is happening. I had one before. But, but I know you were in home yeah. self-isolation, but do you have any debilitating effects, what we call long COVID? Because we know that's a real thing, whereas some people who were infected with COVID still have lasting effects even after they've tested negative. Well, fortunately, I, I have not had the worst of it. Um, only yesterday I had a checkup. Uh, you know, I was supposed to have gone to the doctor in March, but I'd been isolated in Tobago. I didn't get to go. I went yesterday morning and I was checked and the report is good. I have no, the, the only symptom I've had from this COVID is that I had this um, sneezing and sniffling one night. And after that, um, within 48 hours that had gone and I really didn't have any other um, symptom, but I had to stay in isolation for that long time while my testing um, went on until I proved to be negative. But in terms of symptoms, that was the only symptom I had. Okay. As, I was really lucky. I, I didn't have body pains. I didn't have fever. I didn't, and, and now um, I exercised quite a bit while I was in isolation and I didn't have pulmonary problems and so on. So I'm very, very happy about that. Well, we're happy about that as well, Dr. Rowley. So thank God you're over this. But as you said, you you know what some people would have had to go through. And then there are others who, you know, have died as a result of this. But one year later, literally a year and, and, and probably two months later after the first diagnosis of COVID in Trinidad and Tobago, how well do you think we've done? Well, we could always have done better, but we could easily have done a whole lot worse. The, um, this this, this month is almost a year and a half the world has been fighting this pandemic and um, pandemics what pandemics do I, I don't know if you know that when this thing started out in, in January of 2020 it was an epidemic just before that in December we were warned about it and by January it was declared um, that we are seeing a pandemic by March we had to lock down in the very early days when it was an epidemic, it was in China, one part of China, spreading so fast around the population that the Chinese government, the Chinese population could not provide enough masks because that's one of the things that happen in a pandemic. You don't have enough of what is required because it comes at you so hard. And one of the things that we did early in that pandemic in response to it was to send a few, we sent about 30 something thousand face masks to China because they needed it and couldn't supply themselves with enough of it. And then by the time we got uh, affected here, the Chinese were sending to us 
um, ventilators and PPE and so on, because the thing had moved from an epidemic in their location to a, a pandemic where the whole world was covered and many of us found ourselves um, responding, making decisions on an ongoing basis. And I could tell you that contrary to what some people um, from the stands might keep telling you, those of us on the field will tell you, it's a consistent decision-making process. There's no end to the decision-making that you have to make. And um, we, as we, we're still learning and getting new information and new instructions a year and a half after this thing has come with us. Right. And unfortunately, we are at the stage now where we are experiencing now what the Italians were experiencing in April of last year and what Europe was experiencing by May, June. And um, it's really um, sobering to be having these reports of these deaths every day. But we're doing um, fairly well in managing it and we can do more. Hopefully, the results that we're expecting, we're hoping for better results. But it could easily have been a whole lot worse with us. Now, Prime Minister, the opposition is on record putting the blame squarely at your feet for the numbers and deaths that they're experiencing now. Because of your call over the Easter period for people to come to Tobago and Tobagonians to come to Trinidad. Now, I am very mindful of the fact that you did tell people that it's not where you are, it's how you conduct yourself. But the thing is that we are having the numbers. So how do you respond to that? Well, somebody has to be in charge, and unfortunately, I am with my team in the cabinet, and somebody has to blame somebody, because the, the, the one thing that is a given is that as things get difficult and challenging, some people's only contribution is to blame somebody. I distinctly recall the opposition leader accusing me of allowing the virus to come into the country, and that was a, a measurement of my failure as prime minister. Now, I really don't spend much time responding to that kind of folly because in a pandemic, it's called a pandemic because it's worldwide. And to try to blame me for allowing the virus to come into the country, to allow it to spread, to allow it to kill this person, you just have nothing useful to tell me and I just ignore you. But do you think that it was irresponsible to make the call though? I mean, we enjoyed a really, relatively calm Christmas season. And we seem to have had that spike. Plus, we have the Minister of Works and Transport telling us that over 50,000 people went to Tobago. And we are seeing a spike at this time. Well, 50,000 people did not go to Tobago. That is all part of the national, national fabric of lies that are being told. 50,000 people did not go to Tobago. 50,000 people traveled between Trinidad and Tobago. So if 25,000 people were involved going one way, and then they came back the other way. That is 50,000 people between the two islands. So let's start with 25,000. Secondly, on a normal two weeks and a week in between, two weekends and a week in between the three holidays, the normal travel outside of any pandemic and outside of any call from me, there would have been about 15 or 20,000 people going to Tobago. So if, it's, if the figure is 25,000, the additional people who might have gone is about 5,000 people. And many of those that have gone home to their family in Tobago or to their homes in Tobago. So I don't know why we're looking for this excuse. And anybody who's telling you that, you know, I'm too busy to listen to that, you know, because they're deliberately trying to mislead the population. And we in the government spend a lot of time that could be used for other things to be trying to undo the lies and the misrepresentation. That's probably the most difficult part of managing this pandemic, the amount of misinformation and lies, sometimes deliberately put in for all kinds of objectives. And if I try to focus on that, the end result that we're talking about would be worse. So frankly, I don't really spend a lot of time on that. Others do it. But I try to focus on what is, is required so that the people can have the best chance of surviving this onslaught. Prime Minister, I agree with you. There's definitely a lot of misinformation out there and false information and a lot of propaganda and fear-mongering. But why do you think that the people respond to that as compared to the messaging from the government, which has been very consistent since the beginning of the pandemic through all these Ministry of Health press conferences? Yes. That's a good question, because here it is, in trying to explain our circumstance and dodge our responsibility, you're being told what happened is because the Prime Minister said come to Tobago. 
What about all the other things the Prime Minister say? For a year, the Prime Minister has been saying certain things that are contributory to our good outcome. So he was listening to the Prime Minister then. But he said, come to Tobago, or for those of you going to Tobago, and all of a sudden, you only do what the Prime Minister say. I wish <laughs> you were only doing what the Prime Minister say, because the opposition would not have been misleading you. You know, as we're talking about misleading, I want to rectify something here, because one of the things that's being said to this country, in order to destroy your confidence in what the Prime Minister say, is to give you, is to tell you that other people in the Caribbean have gone ahead with their vaccination program and in Trinidad and Tobago because the Prime Minister doesn't know what he's doing or the government doesn't know what they're doing. We are behind in the vaccination program. Let me give you the facts this morning so, I, so that you will know what the truth is. We entered the COVAX program, which is a program where the world came together and created an avenue to get and distribute vaccines when a vaccine was discovered. For months upon months in 2020, there was no vaccine and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Towards the end of the year, we started to hear about vaccines being um, close by and then they got approved. The first one got approved and so on. And the, oh, the whole idea was some of that vaccine will get into the COVAX program into which we had to pay money last year, as early as October last year, we did that. So when the vaccine became available, there's an allocation being made from the factories and the countries that make it to people like us. You know, the first batch of vaccines came to us in March, and there's a the February March tranche. You know, Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. In Trinidad and Tobago, we got 33,000. Guyana got 33,000. Barbados got 33,000. Actually, 33,600. We got the same amount of COVAX vaccines as, as Barbados and Grenada, and Jamaica got about 7,000 more than us. But look at the population size. Our population is about three times the size of Barbados. We are two thirds, Guyana is two thirds of our population, and Jamaica is much, much larger than us. But we got 33,006. Barbados got the same thing. Guyana got the same thing, and Jamaica got a little bit more. And by the end of this month, May, we would have got 67,000, same amount like Guyana, same amount like Barbados, and Jamaica would have got 84,000. So that is, the, that, that is the allocation that was made to us. I don't know one of the reasons for that. It's because our situation was a bit better than the others, that in allocating the vaccines in the first tranche, you know, we, we are treated as though, well, you, you don't really need it as badly as the others. And that is not recognized in this country. But in managing the country's affairs, that position that we were in that was not as bad as other people's position kind of worked against us a little later on. Yeah. And, you know, you hear in Trinidad and Tobago that other people, who are the other people? Guyana used... Chinese and Russian vaccines before they were approved by WHO. I have not heard in this country the population saying to me, let us use any vaccine that anybody produce anywhere and in, inject our people. The position this country has taken, which I stand by, is that we will use vaccines as they are approved and certified by WHO. That is our guard, our protection. And that is pretty much the same. Now, one or two other countries got a small amount of vaccine by way of gift from India. Barbados, Dominican Republic, and Jamaica got some vaccines from South Africa. Those were the only vaccines that came into this region. But you wouldn't hear that from the opponents of this government. You will hear that other people who have vaccinated their country and their programs are well ahead of us and that should not and Tobago. And it's all lies because none of us not one of my colleagues in CARICOM has been able to go out to the marketplace and buy a single vaccine because it's not available. So all the pages written and the demands of vaccinate the population with what? When the vaccines are available in the international community for us to buy, to obtain, to negotiate, we are there and we are doing as good as anybody else in the region and much better than many people in the world. Last time I was reading about some African countries that have tens of millions of people. 
and they have not been able to vaccinate as many people as Trinidad and Tobago simply because the vaccines are not available. But hopefully, as the months pass and the production is improved and more vaccines are certified and people who are hoarding it are no longer hoarding it, it should become easier and easier for countries like ours to get access to the vaccine and we are already in that pipeline. Now, Prime Minister, let us talk about this vaccine availability because I think from where I sit and what I've been hearing people say is that, yes, we understand that we would be getting vaccine from the COVID, from the COVAX facility. But it was also understood from the get-go that the countries would not have been able to get all the supply of vaccines from COVAX, just 20%. So I think people were expecting you as leader of the country to go out and get vaccines so that, you know, Trinidad and Tobago could be sitting uh, because we've always been told that we this did, is the way we out. Go out. But out doesn't have any vaccine to supply. We have been talking to, the, to, to Pfizer. We have been talking to AstraZeneca. We have been talking to Sinopharm producers. But all of these, the authorized suppliers, you going out doesn't mean I'm going to get vaccines. You can only get it if it's out there. What I'm trying to say over and over and over and over, that you go out there, but there are no vaccines to be bought out there. Right, but there were vaccines that, that, that could have been the private gifted. Sector. The private sector that jumped into the blue and said, okay, since the government is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, we'll go and get it because we are more efficient. They could not find a single one because it's not available. We have been out there. We went to Pfizer as soon as Pfizer was authorized to sell vaccines. You know what they tell us? Sorry, we can't entertain you. They discuss a possible supply for a certain amount at a certain price, but at the end of it, we are contracted to supply to others who have already dominated it. We can't supply. Barbados was in, was in an outbreak like we are in now, and they asked a number of countries that had vaccines yeah. and were accessing vaccines, and only one of them provided Barbados with a few vaccines. The others said, in fact, one country said to Barbados, if we give you, the others will expect, and we will not be able to supply, so we sorry we can't give it to you. This is, the, this is the situation. Vaccines are not available, so don't tell me to go out there and get vaccines. Prime Minister, I, I accept your argument because you're the head of CARICOM, so I know you would be more accurate with what's happening at that level than we are. But let us well, just... I don't, I, don't, I don't think you know. i tell you why. As head of CARICOM, Trinidad and Tobago being in the chair, we had to advocate for CARICOM and on the side for ourselves. Other countries were free not being CARICOM chairman to talk for CARICOM. Whenever I speak, I have to speak for CARICOM as the chairman of CARICOM. Some of my colleagues don't have that problem. They can go off and speak for themselves and enter into bilateral arrangements. Some of those bilateral arrangements have embarrassed you now to be. But the bottom line is, while we are chairman of CARICOM, we have to keep fighting for CARICOM. Only, only yesterday, I was talking with the chairman of the United States Congress um, um, division, and I had to speak for CARICOM. I've had a number of meetings with the United States, and I have to speak for CARICOM until June, because I've been the chair as chairman until June. And in the meantime, there are one or two people, only one or two people who were successful in going outside, outside of the CARICOM effort and getting a few vaccines. Yes, we knew that the COVAX could only supply a certain amount, and we had to get the rest from the marketplace. But the marketplace is what we're saying it is. The vaccines are not freely available for purchase in the marketplace. Prime Minister, I'm subject to correction, but what was printed in the paper is that the private sector did have meetings with the Ministry of Health, an agreement was come to to source vaccines, but the, re the reason why it was pulled back was because the government wasn't willing to give that exemption, that tax exemption, to the uh, private community in exchange for the vaccines. But that was the part of the story. Even if we had given the treasury to the, to the private sector, they didn't have vaccines to buy. So that was a confusion that we could do without. That was in the event that they were going to buy vaccines, these were conditions laid down. But that event was not going to come to pass because vaccines were not available. Not to us, not to the private sector. But I will tell you one thing. As a government talking to the suppliers of vaccines and those who may assist us with vaccines, the government is in a better position 
to, at this time than any private sector supplier. Right. Well, we heard yesterday, uh, it would not have been yesterday, day before yesterday, from the Ministry of Finance, <clears throat> sorry, that the government is trying to source 1.5 million doses of vaccine. With the availability of vaccine, where is that going to come from? And how much is it going to cost the country? We have looked, we looked at a number of areas from the beginning as to where vaccines can be made available. One, we looked at the, com the, fa the companies that are making vaccines, and there are very few and their supply is, 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 is cornered by bigger countries that either pay more or have more authority with them. We, so we entered the COVAX and we paid in and we, got, we are getting small amounts from the COVAX. Thankfully, we're using that to um, vaccinate those who are most exposed. Secondly, the, we are in with the African Medical Supply Platform where they are expecting as a big purchaser whenever they get lucky and get a big purchase that we will be riding um, with them and get some of theirs um, and that is being handled through PAHO. The other one is talking directly to countries that have influence with the suppliers and they are talking to us about sometime in the not too distant future like the United States um, and of course, you know, we did that, um, I'll get some from India. We put our, an order in to purchase from India. And I need not tell you that order now is pretty much useless because there's none to be had there, given the situation in India. And of course, we were talking to the Chinese and we've always said to them and to you, when China, there, there, were two or three, uh, there were three or four vaccines being developed in China, when any of them get WHO certification, we will... Um, be in the line to get some. The first one to get it was the Sinopharm a few days ago, and we were in the line, having accepted a, a gift of 100,000 doses, and we have an order for, for purchase of a larger amount. And of course, we have with um, uh, Pfizer conversations that as soon as they are able to deal with people like us, we are in the line to purchase from them that become that. And hopefully, the other ones that have been certified, like Moderna, in recent times, that we access their supply. That is as chaotic as the supply line is. Yeah. And there's no substitute for a WHO certified vaccine. So don't tell me if you can't get it from there, use something else or go somewhere else. There's no somewhere else to go and there's no something else to use. It's a peculiar situation that what we need has to be got from those who are behaving like that or a marketplace that doesn't have it to sell it to you. Do Dr. Rowley, as Prime Minister of the country, do you have, I know that the Sinopharm and the Sinovac, the Sinopharm at least, have gotten WHO approvals. But WHO also told us that the stage three trials uh, of the Sinopharm vaccine, that there's very limited information and they're not sure about how it will affect those with comorbidities or even those who are elderly, those over the age of 60. Do you, as the Prime Minister, have any concerns about using that here for those two categories of people? I have a lot of concern about every vaccine that is being used because all these vaccines have been developed in response to a pandemic and they've been developed in a relatively short time. And in fact, the emergency use authorization is because we have had to respond to the pandemic. The, the, the alternative would have been to wait for four or five years while the vaccine was being proven to be beyond any objection or to use it now and get the benefit that is happening. Now, the AstraZeneca vaccine that was used in the beginning and was widely touted as the solution to the pandemic, are you seeing right now a number of countries are backing away from using it as others become available because of the same concerns about some aspect of it. All the vaccines, there are certain kinds of downsides to them. I, and, and that is not new. Vaccination is a process where a, a small amount of negative response could be had with a vaccine that is deemed to be usable and the risk levels being low. But as, the, as more and more becomes known about vaccines, you can get more conversations and sometimes you may have to stop using it as some countries are doing now or you may restrict it to a particular court in the population because you've known more about it as you go along. But we are not the ones who are making that call. We are relying on the expert scientific and medical judgment of the WHO. 
Otherwise, we'll be advising ourselves that we'll be in a far worse position than if we are guided by the proper scientific assessment. Mm -hmm. And as we use it more and more, we get to know more and more, and sometimes there are adjustments to be made. Okay, well, I, I wait to see what those adjustments are, because I remember, like, even when we started with the AstraZeneca, we weren't sure about if it could cause blood clots, and then after we were here, and well, yes, and even the Johnson & Johnson. So, you know, I know that, I think that that's where some of the vaccine hesitancy is coming from. So, you know, what is the messaging from the government to ensure that people realize how critical this is, that this is the way out, and that they need to be vaccinated? The message from the government is that, let's start with this. Virtually all medication, because it's an abnormal kind of situation, all medication that you put into your body can have some kind of downside. Sometimes the downside is very serious. Sometimes it is not. And it affects different people in different ways. So far, the scientific information that we have on the vaccines that are approved is that the benefits to the average person are there to be had. There, in some instances, there are small risks that something could happen that is unintended, and in some cases, like the blood clots, they're very they are small a risk there. But there are things that we do that have much larger risk that we take for granted, and that is the scientific argument. When you go in a plane or you drive in a highway in a motor car, there are risks involved. And you still do it because you understand that there's a much better chance that you could come home safely and you can travel safely than something happened to you. And the vaccines are in that same situation. And many, many people are on medications of other types that, you are, that are standard and very well known. But if you look at those same medications, you read the defined print, you will see there that there are downsides that you have to look out for, but you trust the the scientists and you trust the authorizing bodies that assess them and determine what level of risk you should be exposed to and take. So because everybody's an expert now in the pandemic and everybody's an expert in vaccine and everybody's an expert in how well the government is doing, you find a lot of information about the vaccines um, coming from a corner which says, don't use it. But what is the alternative? The alternative is to wait until the virus finishes with you, whatever that is. The science is shown, let's take the United Kingdom. They have vaccinated um, a large part of their population, I mean, upwards of 40% with the AstraZeneca vaccine. They have seen one or two instances of negative responses. But, but they've also seen a tremendous reduction. In fact, I think a couple of days ago was the first time in England that there was not a death from COVID for the last almost a year. So they've seen good upsides having vaccinated as against the one or two downsides that they would have seen. And some people take the position, well, since there's a downside of the coagulation that could happen, for some people, let's not use it, especially if we have another one to use. Right. But you know what? We, we, we will use so far, based on our international advice from WHO, our local advice from our experts, we will used so far the WHO authorized vaccines that are available to us. Right. Until further notice. And Prime Minister, yesterday we heard from the Minister of Health saying that we can get to herd immunity. We can get to herd immunity in six to seven months. But I'm asking you, how possible is that when we're doing less than 100,000 uh, vaccinations per, day, per, per, per month at least? Well, the, um, you know, the, the economists have a way of starting the arguments by telling you all things being equal. There's a caveat on what the minister said. <laughs> Assuming that we get a supply of vaccines in the system I've described earlier, and it appears as though we can have a stream of vaccine coming to us at that rate, all things being equal, we could. But there's another side to it. If we have the vaccines in hand, fortunately, getting it from the suppliers, and people are refusing to be injected by the vaccine. We're not going to get to any herd immunity. There so are two things you have to have. You have to get the vaccine to use, and you have to get people to agree to use it. 
So why, why, so why do you think that the population is not responding as well as we'd like it to towards the government messaging of vaccinating itself? Well, I don't know that that is so. As, as a matter of fact, we, haven't you seen lines of people going to get vaccines and there weren't enough available? So why, why are we hammering that people are not using it? If we had more vaccines available, I'm sure we'd have had more people using it at this point in time. But whether it would have been at 30 or 40 or 50 percent, at which you come up against a wall where others are saying, I'm not going to use it, we're not there yet. Because as this morbidity is rising in the population, more and more people will be able to see that the alternative is to get vaccinated and reduce the chances of death being the outcome. While the vaccine is not a cure, it allows a population not to end up with such a high morbidity. So right now, we are going to try to obtain all the vaccines we can obtain, WHO authorized ones, and we will use them on the population, and we are encouraging the population and a certain amount of encouragement is required because many people are hesitant. One, because the vaccine is new. Two, because of the conversation about the um, downsides that might happen. But more importantly, we will encourage people to pay attention to the upsides of vaccination. And we believe that a fair amount of our population will go along with that because it's a response to a condition where if you have no response, the outcome is far worse than the possibility of what might happen with the vaccine. Prime Minister, People... we have about seven minutes before we go to a break. And I wanted to take those seven minutes to look at the economics of things because I know that the government always has to deal with balancing lives and livelihoods. But we've definitely taken a hammering when it comes on to livelihood because we've had to have the restrictions, which I understand. But my question to you is, with all the boring that the government has done, where is our debt to GDP ratio now? And how do we look at repaying back the loans that we've borrowed? Well, the first, the first part of that the answer to that question is that you have to be alive to repay it. And secondly, the debt, nobody will lend you money unless they assume that you can repay it. And when you borrow or you use from your savings, you have to have priorities. And one of the priorities we have right now is to make sure that the population stays alive. So we would love to have had a lower ratio. We are somewhere in the order of about, about 82, 83% at this time. And, um, but if we have to find the resources in their life, it's a human response that we have to try and find it. The priority, the COVID, res the COVID response has demanded that place in the priority line of number one. Regardless of what road we're going to build, or what house we're going to build, or what new project we're going to enter, COVID has demanded that it be number one because it says to us, you got to be alive to do all those other things. And if to, if to, get, if to stay alive, to preserve lives and con uh, living conditions, we have to enter a bit more debt. We do that in the expectation that subsequent to COVID, we would be alive we would be earning and we would treat our debt as we go forward. Because you, you borrow the money, now you use it to stay alive. So that the life that you preserve will be that debt later on. I want to commend, you, I wanna well, commend the government, uh, Dr. Rowley, on what it did to try to help those who were displaced by COVID to give salary re relief grants, income grants. But I've still been getting complaints from the business community some of them are asking about you know vat refunds that some of them still haven't been paid so what what can you tell us about that well i think we've done quite well with the vat refunds i mean we, we, we were carrying a large vat refund debt in response to the covid situation and to allow greater liquidity to the private sector we borrowed and put significant amount of monies in the hands of the private sector and we continue to have um, assistance out there for them. You see, we can focus on what is not being had and ignore what has been had because we did put a number of um, assistance, in fact, one or two of the assistance programs, people couldn't have benefited from it in the way that they ought to have been because they have been under the radar conducting their business in a particular way. And when you ask them to provide certain information to the state so as to accept what the state is putting out, then you discover that they have been living free in the country at, at everybody else's expense. And now 
a simple thing like telling me who was working for you so we can help them. That's a problem for some people. And then, of course, that ends up in a conversation about who not getting and who getting. But you, you have not been hearing from anybody who has been getting. You, the whole conversation about who is not getting. And sometimes one of the reasons for not getting is that you don't qualify. But those who qualify, we try to ensure that they get what we make available, and it is not insignificant. These are difficult monies to find because it's a priority that you take money from somewhere else. All the money we're spending on COVID now, all the borrowings that we spend now from our earnings, that money would have been good, would have been going to something else had there been no COVID. But COVID making the demand for life. We spend that money, and therefore that money isn't available in the same way to other things that would have attracted it. The priority now is to find some to help those people who are least able to look after themselves. We are not undertaking to help everybody who is affected. That is not feasible. But we are trying to help those who are least able to help themselves. Okay. Um, Dr. Ali, if I may just step in here for a second. Uh, all of these challenges that you're talking about with regards to people who are not doing what they're supposed to do or haven't been doing what they're supposed to do, added to the numbers of people who have been um, allegedly double dipping into the funds that's supposed to be provided to help and stuff like that, is there any sort of um, consequences or any kind of thing that we'll be dealing with that going forward? Because it wasn't mentioned at all. We, we just keep hearing about the people who have been double dipping and who have been doing the wrong and not doing what they're supposed to do properly. But are there consequences going forward? Well, there are consequences, and there ought to be consequences, but um, the, the process of getting those consequences is another, is another destruction. What we try to do is to prevent it from happening, rather than try to find the consequences to penalize in the end. We try to prevent it. I mean, we try to ensure that the systems we have in place are sufficiently effective to prevent, um, you know, the abuse, whatever those abuse might be, double dipping being only one of them. Right. So, Dr. Rowley, I know that when this pandemic started, that we had a roadmap to recovery committees set up so that we could treat with these issues. Are there any suggestions coming out of that that has been taken on board already to try to start the rebuilding process, even though we're still in the pandemic? Well, um, you would have heard the Minister of Planning and Development outlining all that we've been following. As, as far as we're able, we have been following... The, 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 the suggestions and you know a lot of recommendations were there and a lot of what we are doing now are in fact the recommendations that are there so some people who have not read the report or think that we're building a road that bulldozer and, a, and, and, and something it's not like that it's a series of what do you do in the circumstances for example what we're just talking about which is support for those who can't support themselves that is a major recommendation from the, the pathway to recovery save people save as many businesses as you can so that after we get over the hump of the pandemic there will be something to be had a lot of what we have done with the private sector support system that is also from the roadmap to recovery because we we did not want a collapse of our systems and of our people so that when the pandemic is finished with us that we have nothing so a lot of what you see the government doing if you go to the report you will see that those are the recommendations Right. So the, the, whether and whether it is in the, the energy sector, one of the one of the other areas in that report was about moving forward with shovel ready projects so that we can maintain um, employment and create economic activity. But that has to be done in the context of the funding for those projects. We have a number of projects out of that we will map for, we'll for recovery. And of course, as we enter those projects, they have to be funded along the way. But the shortage of funding is causing a tremendous challenge for us to keep those projects funded in the way that they ought to be funded to continue working. So it's a, it's a, it's a number of hurdles we have to jump at the same time. Right. But we are being guided to a place where we want to be at the end of this, once we get a sufficient number of people vaccinated in the country where the risks are lowered or the effect of the virus on infected people is lowered, that we can continue to strengthen ourselves going forward. Dr. Rowley, I think for me personally, one of the things that the government has done, while I understand it, that has really tugged at my heart, are the people who are still, the Trinbagonian nationals who are still outside the borders. 
you know, I don't even know how to phrase the question because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think when or, you know, if there will be any additional, any building out of the, uh, the facilities so that you can bring home more people. Because there are still a lot of people out there who are rich. Some of them, I, I can tell you personally, are literally suffering. And I know the government had kind of put something in place to help those who are there. But you know how these things are. It doesn't ever reach everybody. How will the government address this situation so that it can be, have a more empathetic approach? Well, we have brought home a significant number of people, much, much more than the ones who were just caught out there when we closed the border. Well, and I, I shouldn't even say close the border. We have been managing people over the border. The border has been put up, and we've been managing people over it. And we were just about to begin to consider opening up a bit more because people were being vaccinated in North America in a, in, a, in, a, in a major way. And we here had begun to vaccinate and we could have been able to bring more people in. We have brought in as many people as we could manage in the context of the quarantine system being an integral part of our response. If we had taken or if we take the position to get away from that, by virtue of allowing people to come in free sheet, then the absence of an effective quarantine system would, uh, would, would destroy our response to the virus. I agree with you, but any plans to build out the quarantine facilities more, to add more places so that more, of na more nationals can come home? Well, we've done as much as we could do on that, and we keep adding. As you, as if, you, if you listen to the report that we've got, we keep making more and more space. But as we, as, as we bring more nationals home, we have it on our hand to manage. And we have done this a year, we've been doing this since April. And I can tell you, all the people who were caught outside with the closure of the border, even though the notice was short, those people have been brought home. A lot of people who have been going back and forth in a system where you have to get permission to come back, there are, are some of the complainers too. And of course, people who live outside but who want to come into Trinidad and Tobago at this time, we're saying to them, we will, you will come in, but at a rate which allows us to also manage our circumstances at home. And that, that's, an, that's an ongoing process. Prime Minister, we, we're almost up to the news, but one question. We're skipping the news? Yeah, skip oh, the news. sorry. I thought they said that we weren't taking any break and just going. All right, Prime Minister, we're going straight with you. They've, they've, they've skipped the news because you're the Prime Minister. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this for me is a personal experience. And, and I'll share it with you because I just remember just being in, in, in such a quandary. Last year, I had to get tested for COVID because my workplace had a positive case and they thought I was a primary contact. As a dialysis patient, Dr. Rowley, time is important. You know, my dialysis schedule, like most people who are on dialysis, it's three times a week. And I did a test the Thursday night. And to this day, I have not gotten those results. I had to go and do a test the Friday after I'd had dialysis, the Monday. And if I did not get your goodly intervention, I don't even know if I would have gotten those results. I think there's a serious issue to be addressed, especially for dialysis patients, because we had an outbreak in my uh, dialysis center the other day, and people be sitting days waiting for test results. So I don't know if this is something you could address, because it is something that needs to be addressed in a critical way. I don't know that this is something for me to address. This, this will always remain something for the medical operational side of things. I'm sorry to hear what have happened to you. And when this sort of thing happens, it has to be addressed from the operational standpoint. And operations are the outcome of what is in place. Um, I, only this, this week, um, sometimes you're required to intervene on personal levels or on individual development. There was a gentleman in Tobago who had a port problem, a, di a dialysis patient. Yeah. And that to have is, is that his port had a problem that required expert attention, which wasn't available in Tobago. And it was, it had to, you know, the, the individual case um, is something that we are concerned about. 
But in terms of dealing with the overall problem, from where I am and where the Ministry of Health is, what we have, we have to have systems in place where those individual problems don't occur. And that's, occur what I'm say, that's what I'm suggesting to you, Dr. Rowley, from experience, that system is not in place to say, okay, if it's a dialysis patient, let's expedite that PCR test. Let's get the results because our, our treatment is time sensitive and we don't have that in place at all. Well, I'm not sure that you're correct. It may not be in, in the way, but, but again, let me not go down that road because I really don't know the operational side of things. For example, the dialysis patient and a patient going into surgery will be treated differently in the test. And that, there's a priority there. So, so maybe I don't know what happened in your particular case or on that particular day or in the particular week, but sometimes the developments of that day or the week could have caused that outcome. But I'm sure that the, the operator, the, those who are operating the systems would have heard your plea and the empathy that you're talking about and the prioritization, that is an integral part and should form an integral part of their operations. Well, and I do think that such a thing exists. Well, I, as I said, my personal experience has not shown me that. I hope, I really hope that it exists because, but, 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 you yeah, know, it, as I said, that, we saw some that, patients the other day and it was the same thing that I went through. Sorry? Is it, is it every time you go for dialysis that happens? No, what I'm saying is that I had to get tested for COVID, but there was no expediting my test results so that I could get dialysis. And the thing is, my dialysis is put on hold until they know my results. And there is no expediting of the results. That was but the issue. I, I'm, I'm sure that um, those who are hearing your, com your, 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 your complaint now would, that, would give, give it some kind of a attention to ensure that the prioritization that is required takes place. But I do know that there's some prioritizing that takes place in the system to afford certain kinds of patients and certain kinds of situations to, to jump ahead of the queue. Well, I hope so. Dr. Rowley, it's almost time for us to take those calls. But one of the questions we, that we got already from Facebook is, how does the government determine essential services? Because we had the trade union saying they're not essential. They were last year. And we have people saying that uh, NLCB is essential services. So what goes into determining who is essential? And why is NLCB essential? Well, NLCB is a, is a revenue earner for the government. And if we shut down NLCB, it is like shutting down one of the things we need to respond to the practice of COVID. We have to fund COVID um, situations. Right. And if the government shuts down all its revenue streams, then you become helpless. So these are some of the considerations that you have. And it is, when you ask me what is essential, um, we try to identify those things that keep the body and soul together, keep the economy going, keep your life going, for example. The, the economic aspect of what happens in the energy sector, whether we like it or not, we have to keep doing that for earnings. The manufacturing sector, as far as we are able to, we keep our, our plants open to manufacture because that's where we get our earnings. We also have to have our utilities going because we need to have water and electricity. We have to have security. We have to have our hospitals operating. So those are the kinds of things that are essential. The yeah. other things that we're saying that we can, for a little while, do without then we ask that you forego that. Largely, not that we forego, we want to give up that for the sake of giving it up. But we want the people involved in those things to literally stay calm and stay away from the crowds so as to give the virus little chance of spreading. That, that's, how, that's how you go about it. All right. Well, well, I appreciate that. And I think the people who are listening and whomever sent the question, hopefully he or she has a better understanding of the thought processes you know, that go into determining what's essential and what isn't. But Dr. Ole, are you ready for those calls? Sure. 622 that's the number to call. The Prime Minister is making himself available to your questions. I'm going to ask you to be as brief as possible. There are many of you, and if it, well, I would hope that the technical people will be quick on the draw this morning okay. so that if there's anything coming across, that's unacceptable. They'll catch it before it even gets to us. So 622-4010, that's the number to call. The Prime Minister is here to take your questions and let us talk. Arima, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Yes, Hello. go ahead. Yes, good morning, Dr. Rowley. Um, Dr. Good. Rowley, I have a question I wanted to ask. Do we have any scientists in Trinidad and Tobago? 
lot. Thank you, caller. 622-4010. That's the number to call. 622-4010. We are talking to Dr. Rowley. Just really was focusing on the management of COVID from the government's side. And then the personal responsibility. Where are you all? Because I think that's why we have spread. Yeah. Because the public health regulations are in place. The relief... The bill is on the line as well. I right? heard him, but oh. I can't finish my point. <laughs> you know, the relief systems are in place. Right. You know, there are so many things that are in place. So what exactly is causing the spread of COVID? It has to be because we're playing the fool. Agreed. Pleasantville, the, good morning. Morning to you, Pleasantville. Morning, Natalie, and morning to the Prime Minister. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, what I'm, what I'm asking is, given the fact that the, the, the leader of the opposition, not, not bringing politics in this right now, but we should know, she, she, she has reached out to the media to have a meeting with you. Will you entertain such a meeting in a setting where, in a news conference setting where you all can both take questions from the media? Because one of the things we are seeing is that she is not making herself available to questions from the media. Um, on, um, on many issues. So will you entertain meeting her, um, reaching out to her, as opposed to her reaching out to you through the, uh, her Monday night forums and stuff like that? Thank you. Thank you, Kola. The, 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 um, I have a job to do, and the opposition leader has a job to do. So I don't know what meeting with her is going to do. I've got the advice. She, she, the, last, the last advice I got from her on the Monday night forum is to go to hell. I have no intention of going there. I um, spend my time trying to keep the people of, of Trinidad and Tobago whole and to make the decisions that I have to make as head of a cabinet and a cabinet and um, team of nationals who are taking this thing seriously. You don't Those, think the opposition is taking the pandemic seriously, Dr. Rowley? What? You don't think the opposition is taking the pandemic seriously? No. Um, all I, all I see from the opposition is an attempt to find opportunities to score political points. And they, they, they are the source of a lot of misinformation deliberately put out there, which has the effect of making the job far more difficult. Because as people are fed misinformation, they behave in a particular way. And it's difficult for them. For example, I mean, how irresponsible can you get to, tell, to be telling people that, um, that they are the guinea pig? for a vaccine that we had been longing and hoping to arrive. And uh, what am I sitting on to talk to you about on that? You're asking what, what, what size of guinea pig, what breed of guinea pig? I mean, we, we need to focus seriously on this pandemic. And this thing about the prime minister responsible for the vaccine, for the, um, for the not vaccines not being had, and the prime minister responsible for somebody getting sick. I mean, the, the behavior of the opposition in Trinidad and Tobago is scandalous. Just outright scandalous. I talk, to, I talk to my colleagues around the region, and there's nowhere in the Caribbean, in CARICOM, where the government is trying to cope with, the, with the, the, the COVID. And there are people literally trying to undermine the effort as part of the politics. And I don't know that there's anything to be had. I, every Monday night, every Thursday, every Wednesday, is the same thing we've been told. And as a matter of fact, if I may ask you, which of the recommendations that came publicly to the government from the opposition that the government has ignored? They, are, they have all been recommendations to get us in trouble. Don't close the bars. Don't close the border. They don't take COVID seriously. It's killed by sunlight. Bill, like, don't move over the country. Don't um, give, give, give as much money as you could. With no, with no, I mean, what, what exactly has the opposition put to the government that they have ignored? We listen to everybody in this country. And we try to take a pathway that is sensible and useful. As I, as, I mean, I sat down with the opposition early, as they demanded them, to meet with the government. I sat down with them in parliament. The only thing that came to the table from the opposition is a stock up on hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID. When the WHO was saying to the world, don't do that. So if there are, if there are useful suggestions coming from any quarter in this country, the government's ears are always open. I could tell you, I try to listen to everything that's going on in this country because having to make decisions for the people of this country, I want to be informed. But there are people who take the position that their objective, if you, I just, I just told you what the opposition is saying to the country about the government's inability to vaccinate the country. That's not helping us. 
Because if the people know, if their, their job is to make you lose confidence in the government. And the amount of lies we have to deal with on an ongoing basis, every day, every day, every day is a new lie. Because, I mean, look at what happened with the parliament. They wouldn't come to the parliament because the prime minister was, we had COVID and he infected the parliament. They could not be serious. Whenever, you know, whenever they make their serious positions, we don't dismiss it. But so far, I could tell you, you cannot point out to me any serious suggestion that came from the opposition that the government has ignored and said, had we done that? I mean, look at this whole thing. All that we're doing now is because of the prime minister say come to Tobago. What foolishness. Yeah. All right. And when you, if, you, if you place blame in the wrong place, then where the fire is really burning, it will go out. And of course, every other country had a prime minister who, tell, who called them to, 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 to wherever they are. That's why they have COVID raging. So I don't know who called the people in India. It wasn't me. Huh? Doc, we do, have another, we do have another question. Doc, I have a question coming in from online. Um, has there been any progress on treatment options for those who are COVID-19 positive? Because they're saying, you know, vaccines are important, but treating with the sick is equally as important. Treating with what? With people who are COVID-19 positive, who are sick. Has there been any progress on treatment options for those people? I wouldn't want to speak to that. I'd leave that to the doctors. I, I couldn't speak to the, the, the therapy issues. Yeah. Another question from uh, our text board, uh, Dr. Rowley. The person is asking if you've had any similar negotiation with, uh, with uh, Cuba as you've had with China, so that when vaccines get WHO approval, we can use them. We have been keeping our eyes on what's happening in Cuba and keeping our, we are, we are very close to, the, to the, the, the leadership in Cuba, the government and people of Cuba. And as soon as they get WHO, as it was in China, um, we would be in line there to use it. And we will use it once it gets the requisite approval. Um, I've seen a, a lot of misinformation circulating about Cuban vaccines that have been approved, but that is not true. There is no Cuban vaccine today which has been um, assessed and, and, and cleared by WHO, and that is one of the restrictions we have. No, I think the person is asking if you're in communication so that when it gets to that point, if it gets to that point, that That's you'll a, be in line, yes. Trinidad and Tobago yeah. will be in line to get some. Yes, I, I mean, the, the, the only place that we have not been um, directly looking at, the, the, the Sputnik, I don't know that... Um, we have, our people have looked at that, but all the other possible vaccine suppliers are kept under review by us and we are in contact. And, but those contacts have not um, been useful outside of what we've had so far. Right. All right. Well, this person says the opposition leader is too deceitful. She wants to unite to fight COVID, but to Dr. Munalal telling people not to take the vaccine. Stoops. Carrie <laughs> had a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Rowley, I have a question. Uh, we have seen during this pandemic the vulnerability of oil and gas uh, when it comes to the pricing and those things as well. When it comes to the roadmap to recovery, uh, has the government put serious thought into diversifying the economy and something that can potentially, uh, in the future, surpass oil revenue? Well, we have been doing what we can do. That, that, this diversifying the economy is not something that will happen overnight. Yeah. You have to lay the foundation to do differently and to either to add or to change. One of the things that we have here in Trinidad and Tobago is an economy that is heavily dependent on oil and gas. But it is still the best resource that we have available. So we do other things. We, we look to see whether um, we can produce more of our own food so that we don't have to import it. We look to see whether we can, um, we are now engaging in going into the area of renewables and energy production, um, electricity production in the country. We are also talking about getting involved in, 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 in services that we are not now involved in. So those are the kinds of things. But much of what we are going to look at will not bear fruit for us today. So right. we still have to focus on using what we have and we have, have been accustomed to, to be able to treat it our issues today as we try to make the incremental changes going forward. 
Dr. Rowley, Candice from Point Fourteen is asking if persons with disabilities will be given preference to get vaccinated. As long I will, well, the, 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 it depends on the nature of the disability. But as we have more and more vaccines, everybody in all categories would would get vaccinated. But initially, if you have a disability of which which can be classified as a comorbidity, yes, you can be vaccinated immediately. For the Spain, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Natalie, to you and your co-host and to the Honorable Prime Minister of my country. I would just like to say thank you very much to the Prime Minister and his team, and thank you also to all the frontline workers who have been putting their life on our line. Thanks much. Well, right. Today is um, International Nurses Day, and I want to join the under 138 countries who are recognizing the human service and the importance of our nurses. And in Trinidad today, we have a lot to be thankful for. And I want, on behalf of the population, to say a hearty thank you to all our nursing staff, wherever you might be, and all those who are giving health care support in this country at this very difficult time. All right, one mess, one text is asking, how safe is it to use two different brand of vaccine per one individual? But Dr. Wheeler told us that don't do that. Just use one vaccine. So I, I think I'll take that one. Doc, the messages are coming in fast and furious. Good morning, Dr. Rowley. Just thanks for the decisions made on behalf of TNT by you and the medical uh, team, as well as the frontline personnel. The number to call is 622-4010. This number keeps ringing in my hand. It's text messages only. 326-7285 for text messages. 622-4010 for calls. Good morning, Enterprise. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes, morning to the panel. I am living in Enterprise near to the Shugwana's Health Center. It's over a month now we have been trying to get an, op uh, an opening to get an appointment without success, right, um, for the vaccine. Now, I have heart problems, diabetes, etc., right, and they are telling me you have to call a certain number which is not possible to get through. And it's over a month now we left a message on the line. They will call back and up to now no return calls. And I know of many other people who have the same situation. All right. Thank you, caller. Prime Minister, can you answer that? This, the, there are some systems in place, and um, I, I expect that um, from time to time, you know, we need to tweak those systems to make it easier for people to get in. And uh, those who are managing those systems would have, would have heard that complaint. And um, we keep trying to improve the access. But at the end of the day, as soon as we have a, a, a larger volume of vaccines, then we can make the system easier to access. And we expect that in the next you know, week, month, year, not a year, but certainly as we get more vaccines. But the system, that, 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 that system of calling, um, I've been getting a, a fair amount of complaints that is difficult to get through. So I, I hope that it is technically possible to make the, the, the keyboard, whatever it is, the switchboard, I may say, to, um, to, to allow people to make their reservations. Yeah. Um, as, as we get more vaccines, it will become easier and easier for that to disappear from the scene. One text that says, good morning, Prime Minister. Where I work, persons are not wearing masks. What can one do in such a situation? It's 482 Gary, 482479. 482-G-A-R-Y. There are numbers to call, you know, if you're having these issues of enforcement. Bish, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Sir Bego. Good morning to our Honorable Prime Minister. Good morning, sir. Mr. Pete Rowley. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I just called on concern. Um, I was just re reading uh, some history recently, and you was our main pattern within this, this history, where you play a major role in Narva Swamp, in declaring Narva Swamp a prohibited area in 1989. And you play a biblical role, to be honest, in today's role. I'll be very honest. And um, still, I didn't really realize that you played a major role in this. And to be honest, we're looking to diversify in our economy right now and looking for diversification. I think Narva Swamp is one of the main, main, main places. I mean, it is one of the best. Um, place right now, um, um, I would say for 
tourism. It is uh, one of the best destinations in Trinidad, I would, I would consider, for tourism. Kola, you have to make the job. point quickly. And, um, Mr. Prime Minister, all I'm saying is that because I see that they play a biblical rule in this, um, as the Bible says, so, as, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. So I think in this end, we are in the end time, you should play a major role in boosting the tourism in Maribas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, Let me just correct that. It wasn't 1989. I had, I had no authority in 1989. It was probably 1992 or 1993 when I was agriculture minister, where a portion of the Mariba swamp was declared uh, a reservation, um, a nature reserve, for all time. The other part of the Mariba swamp is heavily in agriculture, and the agriculture minister is working very hard to maximize the use of that area. Some people think that all of the swamp area um, should be used for agriculture, but I don't think that's where we're going. The area that's, that was declared a reserve in 1992, 93 or thereabouts will remain an area not to be disturbed. All right, Doc, other we, area, we, we, we have just to, about four yeah. minutes left before we allow you to go ahead and give your Eid greetings. So we just want to try to get through some of these messages. One person is asking, to what extent are risk levels being factored into repatriation exemptions? For example, does the current system take into account a person's vaccination status? Because she said the online form doesn't capture this. Uh, Joel from San Fernando is asking. The, the vaccination status is not the only one because even if you are vaccinated when you come in, you're still part of the system of quarantine. And we, we are having to... Um, take that into account, but we were moving to a situation where as more and more people are vaccinated outside, and we here have more people vaccinated, that we could go towards a freer mixing of the populations. Uh, but we still, we still have a requirement for some, some quarantine. Another uh, text says that many Trinidadians do not do annual medicals and only become aware of underlying conditions when diagnosed with COVID. Can we make access in the public health system available for these medicals by having health center open at later hours? I don't know how many people do medicals, but uh, that, that, um, yes, the, the whole idea of preventative medicine as against reacting to a condition after is what we've been pushing for. And to, to the preventative side, you need to have information up front to make it uh, a situation where everybody go in and do your personal medical as some people do right. that's a that's a large lift for the public health system uh we have pity valley on the line pity valley good morning to you good morning good morning good morning good morning dr diana keith christopher rowley i want to highly commend you you are the best leader for this time to help our country fight the pandemic. Speaking on the line here is Councillor Janelle Shuller, smart from Mokoko Alaskan District. You, I have, I have been following your, your leadership and, and this has been the best the Caribbean, the, the world could look at to emulate as, 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 as a leader. I have been looking though at the child guidance unit. They have been quite short-staffed and there is a need just to plug in one or two more social workers to keep that seamless um, counseling practice being done with the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I want to just plug that in, um, Dr. Keith Rowley, and to continue to commend you for the excellent work, because I know that you have a lot more work to, to, be, um, to be executed, and I trust that all will be well. And be safe with you, you and your family. All right. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, Dr. Rowley, one person says... And I don't know if this is true, that the COVID, the COVID is out of control and they're putting tents and beds outside the Coover Hospital because it's filled to capacity. Are you aware of this? It is not out of control. What we are doing um, is to expand the capacity to respond in the event that we require more beds. Actually, um, what is happening at Coover there, um, we're getting some help from the Americans with two field hospitals one of which is um, at Coover, um, it's a temporary hospital space. We, that's one of the responses that if we are getting more people infected and there's a demand for more bed space, a field hospital is what you use to increase your bed space in the short term. So that is not, that is out of control. 
it is a response to what is happening as we experience a higher level of infection and a higher level of demand for bed care, for bed space. Okay, well, this text says, a blessed morning, good morning, Dr. Oli. Sir, you and your team have done the best that you could have done. Congrats. Keep up the good work. Annette from San Fernando. You are annoying some people with that this morning, you know, because a lot of people have the opposite view. <laughs> Well, uh, this text is saying that a rigid vaccination, I, I don't think it should be drive, it should be messaging, should be done by the government and Ministry of Health so as to overpower those who set out to dissuade the population from receiving their vaccines. And morning, I work as a clerk in a school. I am going out to work every other day. Can you ask the PM if I am an essential? They have other workers coming out every day. What category of work is that? Uh, a clerk in a school. Uh, I presume that that decision would be made by the principal of that school or, or whoever is they're reporting to. Because some of the some of the situations, um, who comes out is a decision to be made by who is running the department in the public service in particular, where the the heads of departments and the PSs and so will determine, understanding that what we try to do is to minimize the amount of people who are out there in a situation where we would prefer if you only come there if your presence is required for something that is absolutely needed to be done. All right, Prime Minister, we just have about two minutes left. So, and I know you wanted to send greetings on the occasion of Eid. So, please, before, well, you, if you, you can make your closing statements about the COVID, you know, probably encourage people to get vaccinated because you said those are two things that you had to deal with, uh, getting vaccines into the country and then getting those, the messaging to those who might be hesitant. Well, first, let me um, take the opportunity to extend Eid greetings to all the members of the Muslim community and the Trinidad and Tobago at Eid. Every year at this time is a time when uh, some of our population enter the fast of Ramadan and reflect on the good sides of life and the responsibility we have to be good people. So greetings to all members, friends, family, and just remember, this is Eid during a pandemic and keep in, in mind, stay away from people outside of your immediate family as far as you are able to, and do not attempt to do the normal thing. I must say that I'm pleased that you have so far, all the reports I've had is that the aid functions are, and observations are following those, keep on doing that and do more of it, and let us try and come out of aid without a worsening of our situation. So enjoy the season and be reflective and be renewed. And with respect to the population of Trinidad and Tobago in general, I just want our citizens to understand that this pandemic is not a joke. It is not something to play with. The, the worst outcome, which is getting more and more frequent in our population, is death. And in many instances, we are seeing now where that death is taking place within families in a situation that is quite tragic, more than one person. One person is too much in a family. Take it seriously. The things that have to be done, we've told that, told that to you over and over and over and over. And each one of us, if we do those things, we will not only protect ourselves, but we'll protect other people. Because those who are being infected are being infected by other people. And if you are infectious, you will infect other people. So we are all interconnected. And it is not a respecter of race, creed, religion, class, political persuasion, or geography. You would have seen that is all over the country is exposed, and all the people are exposed. And now more than ever, we have to be careful because we're seeing more and more young people fall into it. When initially it was being said that it was the older people who had comorbidities, now we can virtually say it's everybody. Thankfully, there's hope on the horizon. We've started the vaccination program treat the vaccines as a response where there are benefits to be had. If you have good reason not to be vaccinated, that is understandable. The good reason being that you have medical conditions where the level of risk is too high, as told to you by your expert doctors. But the average citizen should take the 
opportunity to get vaccinated and give yourself that better chance to come out of a pandemic alive and well. That is our best chance. And we, at the level of the government, we are doing everything possible to get an adequate supply of vaccines. And we expect that our situation will improve in the days and weeks ahead. There's a lot of uh, hesitancy in some quarter. And there are a lot of attempts to destroy your confidence in what you might be doing or what we are doing. I ask you to stay the course. We are ensuring that the best response from Trinidad and Tobago is the response that the government of Trinidad and Tobago will pursue. So let us do that together and try and come out of it alive together. Prime Minister, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the No Morning Show on TTT. We definitely appreciate you. And I think after that very comprehensive report on what the government has done and is doing, we should all be better off for it and have a better understanding of where we're going in treating with this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Keith Rowley there speaking with us about the government's management of the pandemic. And as he said, we all have to do our part now because the government is doing everything that it can to help to safeguard.